This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices, episode 273, was recorded on May 27th, 2021. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by Abra Silver Resource Corporation, a premier emerging silver and gold exploration company, ticker ABRA on TSX Venture and ABBRF in the United States. New York Times bestselling author and curator of the Bear Traps Report, Larry McDonald, joins me as this week's feature interview guest. We'll discuss inflation, bond yields, market outlooks, and much more. Then be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment after the feature interview when Patrick's chart deck will be titled Touring the Commodity Stocks. We'll take a look at the various different commodity stocks and see where the trading opportunities lie. And I'm Patrick Ceresna. Now, Eric, let's jump into that S&P 500 because we're back uh, very close to uh, the 52-week high and the market's just uh, muddling along up here. Uh, What's your take? Do you think we uh, punched a new highs from here? Well, I don't know, Patrick. We've gone almost two whole weeks without a new all-time high on the stock market, and we've reached a point where most people think that's an unusual circumstance. So yeah, I think we go higher, and I think we keep going higher and higher and higher until someday this all breaks. And when it breaks, I think it's going to be really ugly, but I don't think that day is anytime soon, and uh, I'm I'm leaning towards the melt-up continuing. Uh, it will be really ugly someday, but you know, right now I think the conditions warrant further melt-up before there's any catalyst I can see that would cause all of this overvaluation to actually have an effect on the market. All right, let's move on to the U.S. dollar index. Uh, I mean, we're more or less uh, pivoting right off that 90 handle. It's pretty much unchanged from where we were closing last week when we were recording. What do you think is the next move here on the dollar? Well, Patrick, we traded for a good solid week there below the 90 handle on uh, on the dollar index. And I think that's kind of a first. Yeah, we're back above it now, but by what, like three basis points as we're speaking on Thursday afternoon? Uh, we did test 89 spot 50, which has been a critical level. We didn't close below it, but boy, you know, we're getting closer to it. It feels to me like we've kind of reached a, uh, a moment of truth here, Patrick. This market's either going to continue consolidating sideways like it has been, or we're going to see a breakdown below 89. Which one's it going to be? Well, I'm not sure, but why don't we ask this week's feature interview guest, Larry McDonald, that very question. All right, Eric. Well, let's get to the crude oil markets because uh, we're very close to a 52-week new high, a quick recovery off of that dip the other week. Do you think uh, we're heading towards 70 here? Patrick, I do think that we're headed toward 70 and higher, but it's not quite time yet. And the reason is I think the market is still just a little bit preoccupied with this question of what happens when Iranian supply comes back on the market. And my answer to that is it's already been priced into the market. Everybody knows this was coming. What we didn't know is the exact timing of when it would come. It looks like maybe it's going to happen a little bit sooner. Maybe that's going to affect the price a little bit, but I really don't think it's big and important. It has has been holding the market back. And right now we're fighting critical resistance right at 66 spot 60. As we're speaking now, we're only a nickel shy of that. So it's possible that we'll close above 66 spot 60. And I hope we do, because that would be the indication that maybe that breakout that I'm expecting above not just 66.60, but eventually breaking out above the previous cycle high at $68. I think it's all coming, Patrick, but I don't think it's coming until June, you know, until we get into the first or second week of June. I think that's when the rally starts and it continues. And eventually by Labor Day, we end up with a high oil price on the year, somewhere between 80 and $90, which is where I think we're headed. So that's my outlook. But I don't think that all happens until people stop being preoccupied with whether or not Iranian supply is going to be an issue or not. And so far, that seems to be what's on everybody's mind. But we're right on the edge of breaking past 66, spot 60. And I think if we get a daily close above, it's likely that uh, the upside will continue from there. We'll see what happens. Eric, how did the inventories come in? 
was another drawdown this week, Patrick. Crude oil drawing down 1.7 million barrels. Now, that's going by the number everybody follows, which is the one that excludes the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And the logic for why we exclude the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is that's not commercial storage. That's the government storage of oil. Well, wait a minute. In this circumstance, it really is private storage. There was an exemption made because of the COVID crisis allowing private storage in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And that's what's being unwound here. So I think we really had a drawdown of 3.3 million barrels. That's the number including the SPR. But the official number is only 1.7 million. Cushing, Oklahoma drawing down 1 million barrels. Gasoline drawing down 1.7 million barrels. Distillates drawing down 3 million barrels. So between 3 million barrels distillates 1.7 1.7 gasoline and 1.7 crude, you've got a total petroleum product build of 6.4 million barrels. Needless to say, that's bullish and it's been helping the price action. All right, Eric, let's talk gold because uh, another week, another set of uh, multi-month highs as uh, bullion has now uh, temporarily seen uh, highs above 1900. Does this keep going or are we uh, overdue for a little pullback? Well, I definitely think it keeps going, at least in the big picture sense of things. But hey, we just broke through the 200-day moving average. And a very common pattern in technical analysis is when you break through a major level, you see that breakout, and then you go down and test that level as support before moving higher. We still haven't had that back down to the 200-day moving average, test it as support, and then move higher from there. Doesn't mean we're going to get it, but if it does happen, don't let it spook you out. It's a good sign, not a bad sign. Where I think we're eventually heading, though, Patrick, is to new all-time highs in gold, well over $2,000, probably well over $2,500 within the next couple of years. All right, Eric, let's touch on that 10-year Treasury yield. So we had high inflation print. We have a a big new uh, fiscal spend coming. Uh, We have all these different data points, and some yields just don't seem to be reacting to it and actually, in fact, backing off. We're at 1.60 here uh, at the time of recording. Uh, What's your take on uh, where we are with interest rates? Well, the short answer is I don't know. I don't have any strong conviction, but my kind of thinking here, my my initial thought is I, I think that what's happening is a lot of people got spooked out by the government spend and oh my gosh it means they're going to have to float all these bonds and you know that that that's what led to that backing up of yields i think the market has sort of thought it through now and realized wait a minute you know the fed's going to be involved in buying some of that debt they're not going to let rates get to a certain point and the market i think has processed yeah as much as they're going to issue a whole bunch of debt they're also going to probably buy up a lot of that debt it probably is not going to lead to the backing up of rates that some people feared. Now, that's a guess on my part. It could go the other way, which is I and a bunch of other people could find out that, yeah, it really can lead to a backing up in yields of, you know, we're looking at 4% next year. I don't think it's going to go that way. I think it's going to go the other way, but I'm going to keep asking our feature interview guests because, frankly, it's still a mystery to me. Well, Eric's interview with Larry McDonald is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after his message from our sponsor. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Abex Technologies. In addition to sponsoring Macro Voices, Abex also produces Smarter Markets, a weekly podcast that airs every Saturday morning on all the major podcast platforms. Smarter Markets brings together the leading minds in macroeconomics, technology, and commodities to explore how capital markets can be redesigned to better serve market participants and society as a whole. The first episode in Michelle Dennity's five-part series about about the role of digital innovation in advancing the ESG economy features Gajan Candia, CEO of Hitachi Ventera, and is available now. The second, featuring Greg Lavender, Chief Technology Officer of VMware and Managing Director of Cloud Architecture at Citigroup, airs this Saturday morning. But you won't get Smarter Markets on your Macro Voices feed. You have to subscribe separately to Smarter Markets in your podcast app to listen to this free podcast. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. 
Joining me now is Larry McDonald, the man who wrote the New York Times best-selling book on the collapse of Lehman Brothers. These days, Larry writes the Bear Traps Report. Larry, it's great to have you with us. Let's start with a question I've been asking just about everyone because everybody's changing their story, which is inflation versus deflation. So many of our formerly devout deflationists have turned inflationista on us. Where do you stand? What do you see on the horizon? Yeah, I, I'm in the inflation camp as well. It's, um, you know, the, if you think about the previous decade and the investment community globally, I think that, you know, we're looking at 100, 100 trillion of bonds that are below 2% in yield and close to $17 trillion in the NASDAQ 100. And so net, 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 the entire investment community of the planet Earth is essentially in a 2010 to 2020 portfolio allocation. And I think what's been happening over the last like 60 days to 90 days is we've had these tremors, these growth to value tremors in the market. And they've been just just like tremors before a quake, they've been picking up with intensity. And it, it's clear that to me that there's just literally trillions of dollars that's misallocated that's gonna have to migrate and right now, there's probably already a trillion that's already moved, but you know, three or four, maybe five more trillion has to move in the next six months, and so that's where uh, you know the system is, is buckling a little bit. But what we what we're looking at is the previous decade, we had Brexit's trade wars, obviously COVID, austerity in Europe, austerity because of obviously Greece. We had a Grexit and a Brexit, massive austerity in Germany you know, with uh, incredible surpluses and uh, austerity in the United States. We had a sequester that took the deficit from $1.1 trillion to $500 billion over three years between 2000, 2011 to 2014 or so. So, I mean, this is just, we had supply chains that were smooth as silk. And so we, we have like 10 or 20 things from 2010 to 2020 that fostered this incredible deflationary period, this just mind-boggling bull market and bonds to the point where in the fourth quarter of 2019, uh, bonds were bid without in September, October, no offer. I mean, just incredible. And that was before COVID. So now as we look forward, we're looking at a, a Biden administration that is so determined. I mean, they, they lost the 2010 midterms by 63 seats, Obama, Biden. And uh, they're going to spend like there's no tomorrow, especially in the, in the third, fourth quarter of this year with a new, you know, enhanced powers of reconciliation, which you only need 50 votes. And um, at the same time, there's just more fiscal largesse around the world. And so the, the pressures on inflation are, are substantial, much more substantial than they were 10 years ago. And, and especially if you look at the Fed as well. Let's talk about what this means for treasury yields, because some people have been saying, hey, if we've got inflation coming, it has to mean that we're headed toward a regime of higher bond yields. Other people say, no, wait a minute. It's nothing about inflation that causes higher bond yields. It's policymakers reacting to inflation that caused the higher bond yields. And there's a lot of reasons to think they're not going to do that this time. So how should we think about the relationship between the coming inflation, if, if you think an inflation is coming, which I certainly do, and and what it's going to mean for the uh, regime of treasury yields that we have. So, you know, so the Fed is doing 120 billion a month of QE. And um, there's some talk. We, we run a Bloomberg chat with about 650 institutional investors on the buy side. So pension funds, mutual funds, hedge funds. And I'm hearing more and more talk about a shift toward because the mortgage, the housing market's on fire and they're buying, you know, 120 billion a month of mortgage-backed securities and treasuries. So I think one of the surprises looking forward that will, if yields get out of control, which they should in the, by the, for, toward the end of the year, I think with passionately and with the highest conviction that politicians are going to force the Fed into some type of yield curve control. And, you know, we're talking about another two trillion to two and a half trillion of spending. And we're talking about a $5 trillion fiscal plan that's already been passed. So 
Uh, interest on the debt now is almost 10% of the budget. And entitlements and interest is close to 70% of the budget. So there really isn't a lot of room for the Fed uh, and Treasury. So at some point in the, you know, I think within the next six, nine months, the, the Biden team in their quest to win that 2022 midterm and really spend the way they didn't spend in 2000, you know, I guess 10, they feel like they didn't go big enough. Uh, they're going to force the Fed into some type of yield curve control. And the first stage of that will probably be they just pull back on the mortgage purchases and put that allocation over to treasuries. And um, and that should be very supportive of metals, gold, silver. And I think that's why we've had this big turnaround in, in gold and silver. You know, clearly, growth expectations have come down because we've had you know a tough jobs report. And but at, at the end of the day, the market's starting to look forward to uh, this this more fiscal globally. And uh, the Fed and, and and if you just look at all the Fed speak, Rich Clarida has you know talked up uh, Operation Twist type operations, and this would be like a new type of Operation Twist. So yes, I see real yields going much higher later in the year, and then the Fed trying to you know, pull creative levers to uh, arrest that ascent. Larry, let's talk about where we stand with respect to this global pandemic that is upon us. Uh, on the one hand, it seems like at least the pandemic is starting to come under control. But the other side of this, which not too many people are talking about, is the U.S. government has finally come out and officially recognized something, which I think has been obvious from the beginning, which is that the most likely explanation for where this virus came from is a lab leak, not a natural source. And it's not a crazy debunked conspiracy theory. It's actually the most likely explanation for how this happened. That seems to me to set the stage. Now that we have the U.S. government officially saying that this virus may very well have been leaked from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, possibly from research that was being funded by the U.S. government. Boy, it just seems to set the stage for maybe another round of significant geopolitical tension with China in coming years. How do you see this unfolding? As I know you're, you're something of an expert on U.S.-China relations. Yes. I mean, it's it's amazing. If, if Trump says it, it, it it's poo-pooed, but now it's kind of gone mainstream and it's almost better that Trump's not saying it because now people are taking it, you know, much more serious. And, um, you know, this, there's two things really, there's the, there's that dynamic around, around the COVID or origination. And then this, I think another backdrop to this is this, the insults that are, that, that China is put forth on the Paris climate accord are just, I mean, just off the charts, you're talking about a thousand coal plants that are, you know, operation now in in China and another 25 to 30 that are in planning stages. And um, you're talking about a substantial, you know, whatever Europe's done around Europe Europe last year took took 17 gigawatts off uh, the global stage in terms of in terms of carbon. And China just put that on and then some. And so there's a real conflict coming up here where I think we we're going to have to have like in the Trump days, we had the trade war. And at some point there's going to be, uh, I think over the next year, more sanctions toward green sanctions on China. And um, you know, the big winner there would be U S nuclear power or uranium. But um, that's one thing that, that I think is, is, is becoming very, very, you know, obnoxious. It's India, China, especially China, the amount of coal plants that are that are coming online relative to their promises of 2016. And then uh, the, this COVID situation around the, this new cycle around information coming out of Wuhan, uh, both of those things set up for, uh, you know, a much higher level of, of tensions between the U.S. and China. So let's translate all of this backstory into a market outlook. What is the big picture macro outlook in terms of equities, bonds, everything else? What do you see? What do you expect? Well, the big thing is the reopening. So India a month ago was in a horrific COVID cycle. And now cases are crashing in India, crashing in Europe. We're going to have much better vaccine distribution in, in India. India is a colossal 
uh, diesel fuel user, oil user. Uh, you're talking about 6% of the global consumption up from 3%, maybe eight or nine years ago. So, and growing fast. I mean, India population is growing three times faster than the European continent. I should say more so Germany and uh, Italy, for example. So you're talking about 1.4 billion people that's growing at a, at a, at a very strong clip. And you're talking about a, a large group of group of people uh, that are still um, vastly addicted to diesel fuel and oil. And so this sets up for, with vaccine distribution, with a much better situation in Europe in terms of reopening and vacations, I just think this ESG situation in the United States and around the world uh, in terms of oil and shale is just unbelievable and coal. I mean, we're going to have in the next 12 months the most spectacular ESG backfire because we're going to have a, a vast reopening. Demand's going to come back really strong, especially in countries like India as they come back online. I mean, think about it. India, India and Europe were just in a horrific like lockdown, and oil was essentially unched for a month or two. I mean, oil should have been off 20% on that news. So that tells you that there's a pent-up demand problem and the U.S. doesn't have the ability to – the last 10 years, Eric, because the, the ESG backdrop was so liberal in the United States and wasn't there as, as vigilant as it is today, the last 10 years, the U.S. could ramp up production very fast. And now because of uh, ESG – I mean I talk to a lot of bankers in our chat, in our Bloomberg chat, our institutional chat – and around the world. And it's just the ability of coal companies and, uh, and shale companies to finance projects has just collapsed. And this, the snapback in the United States, the United States has lost the control of the production uh, snapback. And that's going to put more price control in the hands of the Saudis and the Russians. And they're just going to drive, uh, you know, I, I think we could have $100 oil and much higher coal prices over the next 12 months, like, and especially in the, in the ESG side on coal, because coal, met coal, is the steel producer of the world right now. I mean, we're years and years and years away from hydrogen produced steel. So uh, you're talking about companies like Coal, Arch Coal, A R C H, uh, that I think would be a double over the next 12 months, trading at three and a half times EBITDA, dividend increase probably coming by year end. So we're looking at, we have a basket of what we call our ESG backfire basket. And, um, and, and that, that's kind of the focus of it is, is energy, it's oil and coal. Larry, I couldn't agree more on higher oil prices coming. Talk to me a little bit about what the drivers are that you see there, but also where do you see the energy plays specifically? Is it just in oil and natural gas or are other things like uh, renewables and nuclear going to come into the fray? Where do you see the energy trading opportunity in this market? Yeah, so, so exactly. So on the energy side with oil, just the backdrop of the ability to to come back online with with production in a faster format is, is that that's much more limited. So we see uh, really a, a vast supply problem climaxing in the first second quarter of next year. Second quarter of next year is the summer driving season approaches. But from a perspective of China and India and the amount of coal plants on the earth and, and their relative pickup of nuclear power, there's tremendous pressure on China and India to take down their additional coal plants and put more of a nuclear component into that mix. At the same time, you've got in the United States, John Kerry that's flipped on nuclear power, Jennifer Grantham at the Department of Energy, she's flipped dramatically. The Biden team's flipped dramatically in terms of energy support for the U.S. nuclear power industry. So there's just, once again, this is a similar to the oil dynamic, but times 10. The world in 2025 to 2030 is short about 10 million pounds of, of uranium, I think, because China has to double their stated plan uh, to bring at least, I think, an, 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 probably 60 nuclear power plants online over the next eight years, an additional 60 
in, in China and an additional 25 to 30 in India. And then in the United States, the, the U.S., you know, the Biden administration and the Trump team, both in agree, agreement where uranium has been a, like a national security problem because we're not producing our own uranium in the United States. And, and so what happens is when you have this ESG dynamic around fossil fuels like natural gas, we're seeing much higher natural gas prices, higher coal prices. That makes nuclear power much, much, much more competitive. And this ESG dynamic around natural gas is powerful. You've got, I think, the new handle is three to, to five on natural gas. That's been a real, that created this 10-year, helped create this 10-year bear, bear market for nuclear power and uranium. So if you're a uranium purchaser, like at a power plant for the last 10 years, you could sit back. You didn't have to prop what we call, you didn't have to, to, to front buy or proprietary trade uh, your uranium inventory. You could just sit back and, and purchase. And we're seeing all kinds of indications that the power plants in the United States and around the world are starting to prop, starting to prop uranium. And we're seeing some institutional clients trying to front run, front run this process. And um, we've seen China already, you know, they're upset about, about the iron ore stocking. And so what happens in a, in a, in a dynamic like this, when you have just tons and tons of un unintended consequences from government policy. Uh, we call it the COBRA effect. But what happens is the, in the free market, a lot of market participants will try to front run demand. And, uh, and, and that'll force a lot of these power plants to uh, pay up and then start to buy forward uranium. And so the uranium industry is only 21 billion in size. I mean, it's absolute joke. I mean, Bitcoin is still close to half a half a trillion dollars in size. Dogecoin is like I think 50, 50 billion in size, and the entire uranium industry uh, is worth twenty one billion dollars, twenty two billion dollars. I mean, this is this is the easiest, the best risk reward trade I've seen in probably my life. I think you have like five to eight times upside, and you know, you know, clearly forty percent downside. But your risk reward to being long URNM CCJ. Uh, URA, you know, these ETFs in the uranium space is just the best I've ever seen. And on top of it, the edge, you know, the U2's famous player there uh, in, in the famous U2 group, uh, you've got celebrities like him that just in the last two weeks are coming out nuclear. So the wokest of musicians on the planet Earth have now switched to supporting nuclear. It's the only way to get to the green meadow it's the only way for China. It's the only way for India. It's the only way for the United States. And I, I, I think that the world is just vastly supp supplied about 10 million pounds short over the next 10 years. So we're, we're going to just see one of the best trades of our lifetimes in this space. The URNM ETF has more than doubled in the short period since uh, they advertised on Macro Voices. I'm personally attributing the entire turnaround in the nuclear space to Macro Voices advertising, but I also respect that there are other macro drivers, which I suppose could have had something to do with it. Let's, uh, let's talk about where the real opportunity is going to be for investors. Is it nuclear? Is it going to be, you know, so, some people are saying the, the copper demand has got to be just off the the charts to build out the electric grid that's going to be necessary in order to support electric vehicles. Where are the best trades in the greening of the global economy? One of the trades that we like the most is in the hydrogen fuel cell space on the metal side. So Impala Platinum, a South African company trading in a, in a very, very cheap multiple, about two and a half times EBITDA and trading at a 20% free cash flow yield. You're talking about platinum in the uh, production of hydrogen, which is a, you know, a comp major component. And so right now in the entire dynamic of, of demand for platinum, there isn't a hydrogen demand element right now. But if you think about electric vehicles and you think about big and large vehicles, much larger vehicles like buses and trucks and ships. Hydrogen is your answer there, much more so than electric vehicles. So electric vehicles is your copper play. And we definitely see, you know, a massive global shortage in the copper space. But 
for larger vehicles. Last week, there was a shell deal, and um, we're seeing more and more large scale transactions on, on the hydrogen fuel cell side. And it's just a matter of time, like this time next year, there's going to be a much higher demand element in the platinum space. And so Impala Platinum, uh, Stillwater, SBSW, those two equities are, are, you know, once again, I see 300, 400% upside, you know, 40% downside, but the, just the, the greening of the large scale buses, trucks of Europe and the United States are going to go hydrogen. That's going to create a new 20% additional demand for platinum. And the amount of platinum on earth relative to say gold is, is just literally like one one hundredth in terms of in terms of annual mining. And so we just don't have a lot of platinum out there. At the end of the day, Eric, there's something going on that is just so you know despicable around the media's focus on this green revolution, and nobody's doing the math on how we're going to get there in terms of the metal side. And uh, our team has spent a lot of time in the last like six months. But companies like Tech Resources on the copper side, uh, we think that that stock's a, a double from here with their properties in the copper space. And then Impala Platinum and SBSW Stillwater uh, on, the, on the platinum side. Larry, I want to move on to an advanced terminology topic that I got from your newsletter. For anyone who is not familiar with your writing, please help us understand the new financial terminology Alpha male central banker. What does that mean? Well, if you think of like the 2010 to 2020 period, the alpha male central bank was the Federal Reserve. And the Fed was pounding their chest you know, hawkish uh, in 2011, 12, 13, created the taper tantrum in 2013. And then they robustly proclaimed in 2018 that they could take 50 billion a month of balance sheet off the Federal Reserve balance sheet down, 50 billion a month at one point. That's what they were claiming they could do. And then in 2015, 16, once again, they were promising us, pounding the table, they were going to deliver 2015, 16 to eight rate hikes. And each time the dollar ripped, the amount of trade in the world that is in dollars is just enormous, you know, 60, potential 60, 60, 62%. Uh, the amount of debt on the planet Earth that's in dollars. Emerging markets, they essentially the Federal Reserve blew up the global economy three different times. Countries like Brazil were in flames with massive political risk in 2018 because you had oil prices moving higher with the dollar. So if you're in a country, like an emerging market country where there is no rail system, and uh, major commodities are transported by trucks. I mean, this is just a devastating blow to countries like Peru, Chile, and, uh, and Brazil. And it created incredible amounts of civil unrest to the point where it looked like Ciro Gomez was going to win the 2018 election in Brazil. And it's you know, a real radical leftist. So these things have massive repercussions. And then we go into COVID where the central banks and the governments of the emerging markets are no, had nowhere near the bandwidth to take on this beast of COVID and to spend their way through it. So essentially what happened behind the scenes, is, and we're convinced, we said this to clients last year, the only way out of this is a globally coordinated alpha male handoff from the Fed was the alpha male in 2013, 2015, 16, and 2018 to the PBO PBOC in, in, in China, the Bank of England, and lo and behold, the Bank of Canada is the big taperer now. So we have, we have a situation where the Federal Reserve has transferred the reins of the alpha male central bank to other central banks. This is putting tremendous pressure on the dollar, and it's something that investors just haven't seen, aren't used to. And they're all waking up to it. At the same time, the global economy is reopening. That's why there's just been so much relentless pressure on the dollar. And we see a major break here. We think the dollar's, you know, it's been on 2018 support for much of the last two weeks. And this is the second time it's been down there. 
And uh, when it breaks, it's going to be an incredible flush and it should break as we reopen globally. And as these alpha male central banks around the world are far, far more hawkish, pulling back a combination much faster than the Fed. The Fed is now a woke central bank, a social justice Fed that is dedicated to fighting inequality, looking at U6 unemployment in the United States at near 11 percent. You're talking about eight and a half million Americans that are still unemployed out of the U.S. labor force relative to January 2020. Eight and a half million people. So the Fed has to dig in here in their woke social justice inequality Fed regime. They've been thoroughly embarrassed of the previous decade. Uh, you could make the argument that the Fed helped put Trump in office. But those, those dollar moves decimated middle class voters in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. Those, those states flipped to Trump. So this whole dynamic of a social justice Fed and an alpha male central banks in in Canada, in the United Kingdom and China has, has flipped the switch and has put tremendous pressure, secular pressure on the dollar. It's going to make new lows as, as we speak. Tell me more about that breakdown that you see coming in the dollar, what drives it and how far can it go? Because as I look at this chart, you get below 89 on the dollar index, at least from a conventional technical analysis standpoint. There's not a lot of technical levels to look at there until you get much lower. Yeah, exactly. And this is why you need to be reallocate the portfolio out of tech and growth and into more value names. We've seen these growth to value tremors over the last couple of months, and they're getting stronger and stronger. And, uh, you know, portfolios like the EWU ETF that are long companies like Glencore, Rio Tinto, big commodity producers, uh, oil companies like Royal Dutch Shell and BP. Um, you want to be long a portfolio that has exposure to global value stocks, Vodafone, Glaxo, IBM names. I mean, these names have just been dreaded. I mean, massively underowned. And there's a, there's a couple trillion bucks that's going to come out because we're going back to more of a 1970s, 1980s regime where value outperforms growth. And the dollar, once it breaks, um, the forces are just are, are so many now because, once again, the Biden team, it, it's the opposite of 2000. 12 and 2011 12 you had the sequester coming in where republicans were taking that budget deficit from 1.1 trillion down to 500 billion through they forced the sequester onto president obama and the democrats don't want to lose that midterm at 2022 at the same time the fed was you know in a you know taper regime and now we're in a social justice regime and at the same time you have $64 trillion of, G of gross domestic product globally, $64 trillion of GDP that's outside the United States. There's only $20 trillion in and $64 out. And guess what? That $64 trillion is reopening at a much faster pace now. So the U.S., what they call American exceptionalism, that was like January, February, where the U.S. had the fastest mover advantage on the vaccines, on distribution, on, on COVID tests, uh, but now as the world reopens and as, as COVID fleets, this is what's going to break the back of the dollar. At the same time, the Biden team's going to come up with this spending plan in the fourth quarter. And it's just, I, I just see this, it's going to be just a colossal flush and that will break the back of these tech stocks. And, and it's going to be the biggest portfolio reallocation of our lives because everybody is set up for the previous decade. Everybody's set up in deflation portfolios and everybody's going to rotate into uh, value names that, that are really have been unloved for a very, very long time. Well, if you're right and this event happens, I mean, I think you and I agree that a breakdown below 89 on the U.S. dollar index, that's a, a once in every so many decades event because that's such a key technical level that if it breaks that, it's probably going not just a little bit lower, but a whole lot lower. So what are the implications of this? Uh, obviously, you just mentioned a couple of them. It means we need to be thinking about having things like gold and oil in our portfolio, because those are the things that are going to benefit from a weakening dollar. What are the other consequences and implications of this change that you see on the horizon? 
Yeah, exactly. So it's been 10 years of owning financial assets. Every family in America, every wealthy family in the United States of America is long financial assets and they don't own any hard assets. The, the allocation of commodities and portfolios and value stocks is at 20 year lows. And so that's, that's the biggest change. Uh, the other is the other to really look forward is this dynamic around and our next book is on this subject around uh, the generational conflicts that are going to come up the next few, 10 years are, you know, just blood curdling because the millennials have been handed 170, 160 trillion of unfunded liabilities. They now have 30 trillion of federal debt. You have the top 100 companies in the United States, the top 100 control 91% of the profits. And when I was growing up in the 80s, that number was like 65, 70. And you just have this raging inequality that, um, that is, is just, you know, underneath the surface, there's just the social bubbling is coming forth. Now, the good news is the millennials are going to inherit the next 15, 20 years, 70 trillion of wealth, Right. So you're going to inherit the 70 trillion of wealth, but that wealth is in tech stocks, Bitcoin, uh, property, you know, growth stocks, uh, 401ks. So if that wealth gets a hit and uh, that, that, that millennial group that has been saddled with this colossal pile of debt, at some point there is a risk of what you know, we call in the Bible, we look back to the Bible and you can go back thousands and thousands of years. We've seen multiple debt jubilees where one generation is handed, you know, a really bad deal financially and just walks away from, and we're already seeing it with student loans, you know, the, there's just a, a, a social movement, you know, not to pay. And, um, you know, what, one thing the woke movement does, doesn't do is it doesn't stop from one topic to the next. It keeps going. <laughs> These people don't stop, my friends. So they just keep going. So they'll go from, you know, student loans and they'll eventually work their way into some type of uh, mortgage debt or the, or government debt. And I, I, in some respects, uh, you can see some of the point because this, this generation is being saddled with a colossal financial obligation that they really didn't have anything to do with. Let's talk a little bit about what we should expect from this reopening. So many people that I hear, analysts, pundits saying, well, you know, there's going to be very, very compromised demand for travel. People are going to be afraid. They're not going to want to go out. You know, Larry, I'm just not buying it. I just take the way I feel, which is, look, uh, I'm waiting for this thing to be over. I don't want to go travel uh, if it's still endangering my life to do so. But as soon as it's safe, if anything, this this pandemic has taught me time is precious. I want to go travel like I've never traveled before. And I predict most of the world is going to feel that way. Of course, not everybody can afford to, but to the extent that people can afford to. And by the way, they're going to be getting, a lot of them, a significant amount of of stimulus payments and other transfer payments, people or I think are going to spend money and travel and uh, you know party like it's 1999 as soon as the the borders reopen. I guess that's a very non consensus view. What do you think? I agree. I tell you. So our book came out. It's now in 12 languages and um, it's one of the best selling business books in the world. It was just uh, voted by the CFA Institute one of the top 20 books of all time. So when you have a bestseller, I tell my wife once a month, if we sell a million books, we'll break even on our Lehman stock <laughs> as a former Lehman trader. And, uh, <laughs> and I'll tell you some fascinating data. So the bear trap support typically in a year will spend because of the speeches around the world. We'll typically have four or five, six speeches. And you know, so many times those speeches are paid for in terms of travel, but we're seeing clients, we're doing things. So we'll, we'll spend, um, call it 150000 bucks a year of travel, and we'll typically do events in maybe six countries each year, six to eight. And so last year, that budget went down from, say, 150000 for our small company to um, $9,000. And, and now this year, the amount of events that we've seen come back online we're going to spend, we're not going to spend back to $150,000, you know, it's a small company, but I could see us up at a hundred 
by year end, and I could see it's well over 150 by next year. So when you talk to families, we have a, like a lot of different, we probably have 700 wealth advisors that are our clients, and they're, they're going to do like at least two times the vacations that they, that they didn't do last year. And there's a real feeling around the people that suffered, you know, the people in the hotels, the chambermaids, the, the, the bartenders, you know, you want to get out there and, and, and take some time and, and spend and, and support some of the people that, that went through an extremely difficult time. At the same time, you want to get out, you know, get, get rid of this cabin fever. So that's where this dynamic around energy prices and this unintended consequences of ESG has taken so much supply offline that if this, if this travel revolution really picks up, and granted, there's places in the world like in France and mobility isn't as easy as it once was, but, you know, especially in airports, but you can drive through Europe. So you're going to just see a colossal uh, pickup in, in energy demand and, um, and a real reopening demand. And I, I completely agree. I think we're going to have a, a, much, a big, much bigger surprise on the upside in terms of travel demand. Larry, before we close, I want to ask you a final question on the energy sector, because I know you have a lot of background on the credit side of markets. And I want to talk specifically about what the end of the age of oil is going to look like in terms of its credit dynamics. And what I mean by that is very specifically, a lot of people are saying, look, you know, we're in the the final decade or the final two decades. Nobody's really sure how long, but we're going to we're going to shift away from fossil fuels to electric vehicles and so forth. And well, therefore, it can only mean one thing, which is energy prices are going to eventually crash. And I think the opposite, Larry, I think what's going to happen is we're going to run out of credit to invest in new production and so forth, because everybody agrees that it's a a go nowhere dead industry. And we're going to end up unable to supply and meet that last demand for petroleum because everybody assumed the whole energy industry was going out of business and nobody invested in anything. And you end up with a crisis at the end where there isn't enough because you haven't completed the transition soon enough and nobody wants to invest in the old stuff. How do you see this playing out? Do you think we have a situation at the end of the age of oil where there's too much of it, we produce too much, and we're just never sure what we're going to do with all that extra oil that we dug up? Or are we going to have a shortage? Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is a classic unintended consequences ESG overdose that is going to have the most spectacular cobra effect uh, where, you know, we talk about in India in 1890, they had the a cobra problem in the, uh, in, the, in the countryside, in the communities, in the towns, in the cities. So there was a coordination with the uh, King of England and they put a one pound bounty on every cobra. And lo and behold, it it worked for a little while. You actually had an arrest of the cobra dynamics, so the cobras were captured. But then all of a sudden, a number of creative cobra farmers started farming these cobras and selling them back to the United Kingdom and the the Indian government. So you you had this dynamic where the, the government actually had to come in and cancel the whole regime policy plan of of cobras. And what did the farmers do? They released all the cobras into the wild. So eight years later, six years later, you had three times the amount of cobras. So this is the unintended consequences of government policy. And with the energy space, I completely agree. I think it's worse with coal. Like coal, coal prices could triple because you just have had such little access to capital markets financing. And so that's why we really like uh, the arch resources names and things like that. But on the energy space, this is so important because I spent before um, our book, A Colossal Feather of Common Sense, I ran our distress, one of our distress businesses at Lehman. And so I lived through a lot of credit cycles in the, with the commodity names. Commodity names were always big high yield bond issuers. And what has happened over the last year, this is once again, the unintended consequences. The Fed has been you know, so accommodative on the, um, on the asset purchases for such a long period of time, they're not allowing the business cycle to function, right? So the traditional business cycle, which has a cleansing process where companies, if they don't finance themselves correctly, they'll run into 
a credit market that starts to shut down and there's a huge default cycle. This whole dynamic has been, been dramatically changed with this incredible amount of combination. And this sets up, an, I think, a spectacular opportunity on some of the equity sides, uh, equity plays in the commodity space, because these companies have been able to extend maturities much further and much more profound than they have in previous decades. And what that does, Eric, to the, to the equity, you, your equities have become essentially a long-term cheap option or a warrant. In other words, nor, the normal cycle of debt financing and near-term debt maturities and the commodity space, you know, the, the typical default cycle that we saw in 2000, massive default cycle we saw in the energy space and coal space in 2016, Peabody, one of the you know most profound to 2016, 18, the most, some of the most profound energy companies went bankrupt. Now all these energy companies have extended maturities uh, vastly, more in an incredible, profound manner, which I've never seen before. And so your equities in the commodity space, and in any cycle, the first move is into the quality thing. So think about the commodity cycle. I've seen this in the high yield market, investment grade market. The first move is into the quality names and then the mid quality. So if you look over the last year, everybody went into gold first. And then toward the, the spring and summer of last year, people moved, moved into copper. Then they moved into oil in the fourth quarter you know, when we started to get the vaccines. And now uranium and, and coal uh, are, are the plays. So you, you will always will see this cycle of the tertiary parts of the commodity space. Will, the demand will start to pick up. And, and where, where investors move from the higher quality names to the lower quality names. And um, I just think that the credit market backdrop is so supportive for the commodity equity space now much more than you're talking about a sector that went through a colossal, horrific default cycle in 2016, uh, and then another in the fourth quarter of 2018, and then a COVID default cycle. So the commodity space has been through three you know, massive default cycles. These companies are lean and mean, and uh, we have a model portfolio. People, people can check it out on our beartraps.com website. But um, I think that's one of the most sexy stories for the next couple of years is some of these commodity equities with much cleaner balance sheets. Well, Larry, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. Listeners, we have a treat for you, which is in your research roundup email, you'll find a link to download a sample issue of the Bear Traps report, which is Larry's newsletter. I think you'll find it extremely informative and very much worth the read. Larry, before I let you go, I want to touch on your book. Now, your first book, A Colossal Failure of Common Sense, was pretty much the book to read on the collapse of Lehman Brothers, New York Times bestseller, very, very successful book. You've written another book. What's that about? Okay, so we're, we're you know, I think we'll, I think it'll be out by, hopefully by the fourth quarter, first quarter next year. But it's, it, it starts at the Lehman era and it connects the Lehman. If you think about global populism and markets, this Lehman event triggered just a crazy dynamic between the millennials, the Gen Xers and the baby boomers. Right. So the Lehman event created you know, such a horrific financial crisis to, to get out of that. The Fed and you know, more of the U.S. government took on a decent amount of debt. And then as we move toward covid so you've had the Lehman COVID connection. Those two events have dramatically increased unfunded liabilities and, and just the, the national debt of the United States. So we go back to Lehman. We start there and we look forward at the next you know, 30 years. And, you know, Andrew Teitler and Alexis de Tocqueville, some famous uh, economic philosophers that go back to the uh, 1700s and 1800s, um, always talked about a cycle that my dad brought up to me when I was about, about my teens, late teens. And um, if you think about the cycles of republics and democracies uh, over the last 3,000 years, you, you always, there's a start out, there's an origination, think about the United States, there's an origination in bondage, and then you move to patriotism, uh, entrepreneurship, abundance, you know, massive wealth creation phase, and then a dependent dependency phase, and then an apathy phase, and then invariably um, these cycles end up back in bondage because um, when the voters realize they can 
uh, vote themselves and raid the public treasury. At some point in time, too many people in societies, whether it be in Rome over a thousand years ago to um, the Mayan civilizations, to um, Argentina, to, to Venezuela, even Puerto Rico, you, you've had these cycles where, you know, if you look at Venezuela now, you're back in uh, bondage. And if you look at Buenos Aires, and um, you're talking about one of the most beautiful, pristine gem cities in the, in this, in the uh, 1800s on the planet Earth. You know, the, the wealth in Buenos Aires is just incredible. So these cycles have been going on for thousands of years. And um, the United States has the blessing of the Federal Reserve and MMT that's extending the cycle. So instead of having to sell bonds, the U.S. voters are voting themselves to raid the public treasury, and the Federal Reserve is financing that. And so the, the question is, does that extreme financing weaken the dollar this year and next year? And then eventually we go back toward this cycle. And I'm not saying we're going to be in bondage or anything like that in the United States, but it's clearly you can see that we're in the middle to later innings of the dependence to apathy stage where an incredibly large percentage of Americans are supported by um, transfer payments. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, the largest percentage in the last hundred years. And so these, these events have dramatic consequences. And, th- and that's what our book is all about, is looking forward and how do we invest in that type of uh, regime. Well, Larry, we look forward to getting you back on the show in a few months for another update. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back after this message from our sponsor. Looking for exposure to rising silver and gold prices? Abra Silver Resource Corporation, ticker ABRA on the TSX Venture Exchange, and ABBRF in the United States, is rapidly emerging as one of the premier silver and gold-focused exploration companies. Abra Silver has an advanced stage project with a large resource base of over 140 million ounces on a silver equivalent basis and continues to announce several very high-grade silver and gold drill results, with more results still pending. Abra Silver is very well-funded with a strong shareholder base and excellent exploration upside potential. You can find a link to the latest press release in the Research Roundup email. Visit abrasilver.com for more information. Information. That's A-B-R-A silver.com for more information on this silver and gold exploration stock. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to have Larry finally on the show. You know, he really has some strong convictions about things like the dollar and and on so many of these different commodities. So I decided to put together a chart book just to kind of talk about all of these things. Looking forward to, to kind of going through it all here. Uh, what did you take away from the interview? Well, Patrick, I thought the most important thing about this interview was the extent of Larry's conviction on the dollar bearish outlook. And I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with him. I really don't know. But what struck me about this is, you know, the market's going to tell us because, frankly, that 89 level really kind of has to hold on the dollar index. If you just look at the chart from a technical analysis standpoint, if it doesn't hold, the next support is, is way the heck below that. There's lots of room for it to just crash from there. So it kind of has to hold in case it doesn't. And the way I'm looking at this is I'm don't think I'm smart enough to really have a view. I I don't have the confidence that Larry does, but I do think we're going to find out pretty soon here. Either the dollar is going to break below 89 in the next few months, or it's not. And if it doesn't, I think it kind of makes an important point. And if it does, well, then I think it's probably going to keep going. I don't really have any strong conviction about where that's going or what the outcome's going to be, but it does make me think, Patrick, that I really ought to be getting my thinking around the U.S. dollar kind of together and be ready for it when it does happen, if it happens. So let's go to the post-game chart book. Listeners, you'll find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, it means you're not yet registered at macrovoices.com. Just go to the homepage, macrovoices.com. Look for the red button that says looking for the downloads right above Larry's picture on the homepage. 
Patrick, let's take a look at page two where you've got the U.S. dollar index. What are your thoughts? If we did get a breakdown below that uh, 89 level, what do you think the, the next logical target is? Seems to me like it's not just a little bit lower, it's a lot lower. Right. I, mean, I want to make a couple of bigger observations and then, and then talk about some targets. I mean, one of the interesting things is that a lot of people, when they hear about the idea that the U.S. dollar is going to have some big bear market breakdown, they immediately associate it with the U.S. dollar losing its world reserve currency status, and somehow it's, uh, it's the breaking of the dollar. But, you know, when you go and look at the last, you know, 30, 40 years of charts on, on the dollar, there have been two occasions where the U.S. dollar lost 40 plus percent of its value in these kind of like half decade long trends. And we really have been in a very sideways trade range bound market for the last five years. And we have not had a big currency move. And it, it really does ask the question of whether one is coming here. And, and more importantly, if we did have a dollar breakdown, I mean, uh, especially for something like the dollar index, which is a trade weighted against uh, predominantly the euro, it, it by default implies that the euro would strengthen immensely over that period. And the question is, in a period where they have themselves all sorts of issues with debt and and things like that, will they can they sustain a much stronger currency on a relative basis? And one way or another, we are at a pretty critical moment, and this is the, something that Larry was talking about and yourself. And it is a moment where we're going to find out whether this trade range that's been in place more or less for the last five years is finally broken. Obviously, a retest of lows that we saw from 2008 to 2014, which are all around the 80 level on the index, are entirely on the table if we have a breakdown. Uh, and this is, a, oh, I think, one of the bigger macro questions to solve. I think almost all the major commodity bull markets that we have seen in the past well, often came on the back of a weak dollar cycle. And so a breakdown here of this 90 level would certainly be a tailwind for that commodity bull market story, which we're going to be talking about. I definitely agree that it would be a major tailwind for the commodity bull market. I just haven't decided if it's going to happen yet. Well, I think the market will tell us. We don't have to decide for it, right? <laughs> but anyway, let's... Uh, well, and that was exactly my point before, is I think the market's going to tell us and tell us in a big way. And in the case of the dollar index, I think we're going to get that decision from the market relatively soon. I mean, in the next few months. For sure. And so on page three, I wanted to just show that crude oil chart. And the crude oil has respected that 50-day moving average very well. I mean, it's it's interesting. It seems uh, that that 50-day moving average has worked uh, well for all, not only commodities, but obviously the stock market and a whole array of different stocks. And what we had was a scenario where we had a very quick dip on the downside of crude oil and it immediately got bought on dip and worked its way to the, uh, to the upper end of this range. What's particularly interesting about this is that crude oil seems to be poised for that potential breakout, but not very many other commodities are. And it's interesting that uh, that crude oil is such a huge market on a relative basis to the other commodities. This certainly is going to be one of the big questions as to whether or not there's still a little bit more left in this reflation trade. If we see that punch to 70 plus dollars on the upside, that will certainly get things buzzing in the markets. Yeah, notice also, Patrick, the tops all being aligned. Going back to the March high that we had in crude oil, that actually got up to 67 spot 98 on the front month contract, not on the July contract, because back then, you know, in, in the beginning of March, at that point, the April contract was the front month. But the July contract never got above that. And we're right back up to pressing the same highs or, or testing the same resistance level on the contract chart that we were testing back in March. When we get through that level, the way I look at this is even though it doesn't quite visually look like it on the chart, we've really been consolidating since March, trying to get above that 66 spot 60 level on the current July contract. And I think that when that breakout happens, it probably sets the stage for a pretty significant move up from there. The thing is, I don't know if that move starts next week or not for two or three more weeks. We'll see what happens. 
All right. Well, I wanted to just touch on some of the energy stocks themselves. On page four, I have the XOP, which is the oil and gas exploration ETF. And I particularly chose this over the XLE, which is very heavily weighted in the majors. And uh, what we have here is a chart that looks actually somewhat similar. It's uh, it's pressing toward its 52-week highs. And and I actually think that, uh, that this could break out here in line with oil. But one of the interesting observations I was going to make was we're starting to see divergent price action amongst the basket of energy stocks, particularly a few of those majors like Exxon Mobil, who, which has been on the pr- in the press and, and a number of these other ones that are transforming themselves. And we're starting to see uh, less and less energy companies actually breaking out. And so the breadth is, uh, is thinning. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out whether or not that's significant, the fact that we don't have a very broad base participation on the upside. But uh, certainly in the case of the XOP, I think it looks like it's poised to follow through if oil breaks out. Patrick, it's noteworthy too that the closing print is what's most important, the closing price. And I just want to let our listeners know, I've described earlier in today's podcast in the market wrap, hey, it's not quite the close yet. We're still below 66 spot 60, and that's the critical level. As we're speaking right now, Patrick, we've still got 45 seconds left until the pit close, but the price is shooting up through 66 spot 88 as I speak. In other words, we're getting the closing print above 66 spot 60, and I think that's a signal that maybe a breakout is beginning that's going to take us much higher. We'll let you know next week whether that was right or not. In any event, Patrick, let's move on to page five, where you've got the metals and mining ETF, XME. Right. And this is a, a broader basket of uh, mining stocks. It has uh, uh, steel stocks and aluminum stocks like Nucor and Alcoa, and it also has a number of gold miners like uh, Newmont and Royal Gold and the baskets. And so this, uh, after just consolidating for a week, looks like it's ready to go for a, a, another attempt at a 52-week high, and, and it's really working higher. And so these, uh, uh, these uh, mining stocks really don't seem to want to quit and it really does feel like there's they have at least the price action continues to be very bullish and all dips seem to be bought and it looks like uh, they're going to at least uh, take a stab at making a 52 week high early uh, next week patrick i agree i think that both precious metals and other mining like copper mining looks pretty darn good here and sure enough on page six you've got a copper chart tell us more yeah, well, this is the um, Global X Copper Miners ETF, the COPX. And what's interesting here is, is that uh, we once again are finding that 50-day moving average being tested on pullbacks. And in the typical fashion that we see price action work is, is that you have uh, a 52-week new highs, and then it uh, mean reverts and corrects back toward the average, finds support, and then bullishly breaks out. And here we have that same scenario playing out. It'll be really interesting to see whether this is a, where a brand new bull advance in copper can begin. Patrick, you've got the URNM, Uranium ETF, on page 7, which is more than doubled since I bought it when they uh, first advertised on Macro Voices. What's going on here? Right. And, I, you know, Larry was talking about uranium quite a bit, and I thought it was worth uh, putting up some charts on this. And again, almost all of the cyclical style uh, resource companies and uh, and ETFs for them have just remained so very bullish. This uh, uranium ETF made a fresh 52-week high in May. The entire consolidation has been just sideways holding at, uh, above all of its previous highs that made in February and March. And once again, is attempting to break out higher. I know Larry mentioned uh, companies like Cameco, which continue to to press 52-week highs as well. And so the uranium space continues to to behave very well. And so with the uranium doing well, what's interesting is we move on to page eight there, Eric. We have uh, the gold miners ETF, the GDX. And what's interesting is the gold miners were the ones in the doghouse through much of the start of the year. The first quarter of the year, they were just not participating while almost every other resource sector was. And what we've seen is uh, since the start of April, that really clean bullish breakout on the upside. And the gold miners have really joined the party. And it's interesting to see that... uh, 
uh, during the pullback that we've seen in copper and a few of these other areas, gold has just uh, held up like a champion. Uh, it'll be really interesting to see whether when we inevitably get some sort of a market correction, whether it's rapidly bought on dip to show the characteristics uh, that are very typical of something that has begun a new bull cycle. Now, Patrick, Larry also emphasized the importance of coal mining. Is that why Arch Resources is here on page nine? Yeah, I just wanted to put some context into uh, the, where the coal miners were. They they were one of the last spaces to start joining the commodity bull market party, right? And and when we look at Arch uh, Resources, the ARCH, we can really see that it spent an extended period of time consolidating through almost all of 2020. And just recently here in the last month, have we broke uh, above all of those uh, previous highs around the fifty fifty two dollars range that were there for the last six months. And so it really does look like the coal miners are getting a little bit of a breakout. And we'll see whether that leads them to, uh, to heading back toward their 2019 and, and early 2020 highs. What I also wanted to show, though, was another coal miner in Peabody. And this is a far more volatile one, symbol BTU on, on page 10. And what's really interesting is just shows the devastation that the coal uh, miners have been under during the the last two, three years that saw the stock wipe out from $45, basically down to under a dollar. And we're really now seeing an extended basing formation establish themselves, and they're just starting to turn up. It'd be really interesting to see whether uh, that view by so many people, including Larry, that these coal miners are turning uh, really starts to uh, gain some traction. Well, Patrick, it's a really interesting story because the ESG movement has essentially shamed the professional investment community out of investing in coal, even though it's actually a profitable investment. That leaves opportunity for other people. In any event, for our listeners who want an even better deal, you can get Patrick's service, Big Picture Trading, completely free of charge. Well, for the first 14 days anyway, by signing up for a free trial at bigpicturetrading.com. Details on page 11. We're going to leave it there for this week's show. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by Abra Silver Resource Corporation, a premier emerging silver and gold exploration company. Ticker ABRA on TSX Venture and ABBRF in the United States. Patrick, tell them what's in this week's Research Roundup. You're going to find the transcript for today's interview as well as a link to download Larry's Bear Trap Report and the link to the chart book that we just discussed here in the post game. There's also a link to Zoltan's latest shocker, The Taper Will Be Bullish If... Dot, 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 as well as a link to Seth Levine's article, Inflation is Shortages and Thankfully Transitory. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's Research Roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners. And we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at Research Roundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend, that's Eric spelt with a K, and myself at Patrick Ceresna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at macrovoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. 
And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.